This morning we'll be considering Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. In a connection with it, I'd like to read together with you two passages from the Old Testament, um, namely from the prophecies of Isaiah. The, the apostle references these uh, passages in his writing. So let's read this uh, together in the first place. We'll read first from Isaiah chapter 64, the first seven verses, and then we'll jump ahead into the next chapter, speaking about the new heavens and the new earth. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by ear, no eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry and we sinned, and our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. And from there, the prophet, inspired by the Lord, speaks of the words of God, that the Lord still remembers and comes and redeems and renews his people. And the next chapter carries forward in this, speaking about the new heavens and the new earth. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall be there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old. The sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they're yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Let's turn now to the New Testament, to Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. We'll read together this chapter. Herein, Paul speaks about what is known through the Spirit and what the world knows. And he acknowledges that ultimately it's only in the Spirit that we may discern all things. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. 
And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Now, our text for this morning, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Brothers and sisters loved by Christ, in today's society there are huge cultural shifts taking place to to allow people to live their lives free of what others think. Now, what others do in their spare time, the, the sorts of activities they get up to, what sort of relationships they have, how they decide to dress, the faith they follow, the food they decide to eat, none of it should matter to anyone else. So you shouldn't judge others based on it. And various laws even have popped up to promote this idea. More and more efforts are made to make shaming people shameful. And at its core, this is an idea that resonates with us. After all, who likes to be judged? Who enjoys delaying or or even denying their own desires because of what others say or think? Just let me live my life, we think. I'll let you live yours. And that's the only way we think that society can function and for civilization to prosper. But such a perspective is attractive because of pride. That I know what is best for me. I know what I want. And I am perfectly capable of deciding things for myself. You don't know me, so you don't get to decide for me. I am to be the judge in my own life. But now we have the gospel. And the gospel of Christ Jesus calls us to dismantle our egos, to shelf our pride, that we do not know how to properly judge things as they truly are. For the Lord who's created all things and and how He intends for humanity to live, it's not acceptable to the natural person. Now because of sin, because of the fall, man willfully misunderstands all things so as to avoid accepting the spiritual truths of the eternal God. And the gospel, it comes to us and it reminds us of this, points us in humility to Christ, to His renewing Spirit. The only ways that we may begin to properly understand, begin to properly discern all things. This morning, brothers and sisters, let us consider how we are to humble ourselves before God because of His grace at work in us, allowing us by His Spirit to spiritually discern and judge all things when otherwise we be left in darkness, unwilling to understand anything. We'll do so with the following theme and points. Members of the Church of Christ spiritually discern all things. We'll see first what is discerned. Secondly, who discerns this. Thirdly, who fails to discern this. Members of the Church of Christ spiritually discern all things. We'll consider first what is discerned. Verse 15 here, it's a particularly interesting verse and fascinating for many Christians, especially the second clause, but is himself to be judged by no one. Many read such a saying and take it as justification for their actions. It's an excuse of sorts when admonished by others, even within the church. Rather than heed another's rebuke, one can simply point at verse 15 and among other verses in the Scriptures and shrug it off. You can't judge me, they say, for I am to be judged by no one. 
Now, such a position does not hold up under careful scrutiny, however. Since it's a poor understanding of this passage and and fails to account for all the other passages that speak, uh, for example, of the judgment to come. Or the exhortations to heed the encouragements, the admonishments, even the exhortations of the church. Church discipline. Indeed, this very same letter that Paul writes, 1 Corinthians Paul admonishes them for going to court with each other rather than letting a fellow Corinthian try the case, judge them, and settle a dispute. No, such a passage is not about having some sort of -of get-out-of-jail-free card to, to do whatever you want. That although the Christian enjoys a great deal of freedom, Paul reminds us in Galatians 5 not to use our freedom for the flesh. Or to use our freedom in service, a service of love before God. God's not happy when we sin. So we are to strive not to sin and instead live in the grace that He gives us by His Spirit. And this is what this passage is actually about it's about spiritual discernment, it's about understanding what God has revealed to us. It's about knowing Jesus and the value that He has placed upon us and therefore desiring to live for Him. It's about recognizing the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and beginning to live by the Holy Spirit and not by our old natures. Hence, we have Paul's statement about the things of the Spirit of God. Paul's carrying forward what he had just said about having received the Spirit of God and from God. The Spirit of God makes it possible for us to understand the gift of God, namely the gospel of salvation. This is the secret and hidden wisdom of God. This is what He has decreed from before the ages for our glory. And the wisdom of God, the gospel in Christ, it's folly for those who are perishing. More specifically in the previous chapter, Paul says that the word of the cross, it's folly for those who are perishing, but for us, it's the power of God. And he goes on and he says again that it's a stumbling block for Jews, folly to the Gentiles. The gospel of Christ is powerful testimony, beloved. It's the work of recreation. It's the power of God at work. It's the work of putting to death sin and rebellion and misery and foolishness and bringing to life spirit-filled, fruit-producing, Christ-following worshipers of God who have glory in bringing to Him glory. This is the gospel. This is the gift of God. This is foolishness to those who are perishing. But being made alive by the Spirit, we are able to discern our purpose in life. Our purpose is namely to glorify God, to enjoy Him forever, to understand that we have utterly failed in that, that we are condemned to wrath. And yet rejoicing all the same in the grace so generously given through the work of Christ and beginning thereafter to live by the discerning power of the Spirit according to God's Word and thereby glorify Him again and enjoy Him once more as we were created to do. So you see, discerning the things of the Spirit of God, namely the power of the cross... It's not just about accepting Jesus died on the cross. It's recognizing we share in it and the impact that it has on us. Uh, Throughout the Scriptures, we can read about how we share in Christ's crucifixion by the death of our old nature and the things of the world. You read of this in Romans 6, Galatians 6, and that the only way we stop seeing the gospel as folly and start seeing it as the power of God is in Christ. The cross of Christ, it ruins our human pride, it shatters our egos, and it is therefore beyond understanding for the unconverted mind. But no human can boast in the presence of God. 
As you can see, beloved, there would be a gross misappropriation of this verse to say that it's to get out of judgment of others. You can't judge me. I am to be judged by no one. To not disregard the exhortations of fellow believers in the things of God. Would we insult Christ? Would we receive the gift of regeneration and consider it a tool to to go back to foolishness, to go back to death? Regeneration is not inferior in power. It is not a lesser power of God compared to His act of creation. God spoke and it was so. Regeneration is not less in power to even raising the dead. We've read this morning from the prophecies of Isaiah, the closest references to what Paul refers to in verse 9. Paul does not concern himself with the particular details of these passages, so we do well to try to read something into it that is not present. We ought not to do that. Rather, We can read from both Isaiah and from Paul the powerful truth of a God who is beyond human understanding, giving to us something beyond human understanding. Isaiah foretells of God's glories. Paul speaks of God's glories. God is beyond our knowledge, and He gives us things beyond our knowledge. And the work of God in us, what God gives to us through the cross of Christ, that is what is beyond what any eye could have seen or ear heard or heart of man imagined. It is the blessed communion with God that we may now even hear experience already in our hearts. Be filled with a love, a delight to live with them in blessedness. It's what allows us to humble ourselves when mankind would boast in themselves. It allows us to rejoice even in suffering, as James writes. To not despair in anxiousness when catastrophe strikes, but instead find peace in prayer before God. That is wisdom compared with the foolishness of man. Do you believe it? Are you discerning the power and wisdom of God? The outpouring of the Spirit and the work of regeneration in us is more miraculous than any sign and wonder performed in this broken world. Would you rather go back and receive the signs given to those who perish? To maybe to to sit by the shores of the Sea of Galilee with the 5,000 at Jesus' feet to eat the bread that He broke. Or further still, to see fire fall from the heavens and consume Elijah's sacrifice there on the mountain in the face of the priests of Baal. To witness the water from the rock as before Moses. How many of the Jews ate the bread of grains that Jesus shared, but then would go on to reject the bread of life He offered? What sacrifices to God did Ahab and Jezebel offer in response to Mount Carmel? How many Israelites in the wilderness had their sinful passions quenched even as their thirst for water was satisfied? As miraculous as those miracles were, they don't even hold a candle to the fire that is lit by the Spirit of God in our hearts. Beloved of Christ, if you believe in Christ Jesus, that is a miracle beyond human understanding. If you are among those who see in Christ, who hear the word of the cross, a word that is really power and wisdom and grace, it gives you new life that lasts into eternity. Life, hope, peace. You are a new creation. And you begin to discern all the things of God.
Who discerns? Who discerns a miracle beyond understanding? Or the power of the divine in our hearts? Secret, hidden wisdom, access to truths even the rulers of the age can't understand. These are the sorts of things that would draw people in. People who crave power. People who crave control. People who who want to feel important. And all throughout history, charlatans, swindlers have coaxed people into false religions and cults by feeding on their self-interest, their desire to feel secretly better than others. Come, follow me. Listen to my sermon. I will give to you secret wisdom. But that's not what Paul is getting at here. He's not selling the secret to unlimited power to to control the universe or even the things around you. He's not given the elixir to do whatever you want. No, when he tells us that things are spiritually discerned, Paul wanted to be clear that the Christian who understands the secret and hidden wisdom of God isn't in and of themselves, they're not intrinsically better than others. He was well aware of the egos of the Corinthians and how the idea of knowing something that others didn't would make them feel better than others. But although it is a great treasure to know the gospel, though it's something that brings us into glory, though it's unimaginable what we receive, Even when compared with the greatest minds of the world, it's not something that makes us better than them. For it's in the Spirit. And it puts the nail in the coffin on claiming one man or another as your leader. Since we're dependent on the Holy Spirit the one from God. Therefore, we're not dependent on men like Paul or Cephas or Apollos. In the next chapter, we'll cover that this afternoon, Paul goes on to to remove that kind of thinking. We're to boast in the Lord, not in mere mortals, not in simple men. A proper understanding of God's revelation only results in humility. It results in recognizing that, but for the grace of God, I would never have accepted this beautiful prize. It results in confessing that I have not understood the depths of the riches of God's grace. It results in acknowledging that I'd have never received God's gift by my own strength. I would have rejected it for the squalor of the world. For apart from the Spirit of God giving discernment, how much different are we than the rulers of verse 8? Their condemnation is just. They will receive judgment for failing to rule and judge properly. But they ruled, they judged, with a lack of understanding. With their foolish hearts darkened by sin, they were willing to crucify the Lord of glory. But we too, beloved... As children of wrath, a part of God's grace would have crucified him. We too would have rejected the gift of God. That's Paul's point here. We can't boast in ourselves, not even the fact that we've accepted Jesus into our hearts by faith. For we only decided that with a new and spiritual nature that was given us by his Spirit. This truth is spelled out beautifully in the Canons of Dort. In chapter 3, 4, in article 11, we can read, God carries out His good pleasure in the elect and works in them true conversion in the following manner. He takes care that the gospel is preached to them and powerfully enlightens their minds by the Holy Spirit. So what? So that they may rightly understand and discern the things of the Spirit of God. By the efficacious, that's effective, the Spirit is working. By the, of the same regenerating Spirit, He also penetrates into the innermost recesses of man. That He opens the clothes, He softens the hard heart, He circumcises that which was uncircumcised, and instills new qualities into the will. And He makes the will which was dead 
Paul writes to the Ephesians. We were dead in our trespasses. He makes it alive. He makes which was bad, good, which was unwilling, willing, which was stubborn, obedient. He moves and strengthens it so that like a good tree it may be able to produce the fruit of good works. This is our confession. Chapter 3, 4, Article 11. The power of God at work. It's this power, the working of the Spirit of God that caused right to the heart, makes what was dead alive again, that we judge and are judged by no one. That's how we understand this clause. Now, we take care with this word judge. But today, it's 2023. An expression of judging someone has a negative connotation. But we should be thinking about it as making judgments on things, as in making weighty decisions on things. Perhaps more accurately, following the Greek, we'd say we, we appraise things. And since we're able to discern things, we can decide what is true, what is not. Much like in appraising diamonds. Looking at a fine diamond, the untrained eye cannot tell much difference between them at all. It's only the trained eye, under carefully directed light, with the use of lenses, that they will be able to discern any flaws or blemishes in a diamond and be able to properly appraise it, judging a diamond to be of great value or relatively little value. We too, in a similar fashion, with the light of God's Word and with His Spirit giving insight to see clearly, are able to discern matters in this life and be able to properly appraise things, judging whether we are following Christ or not in a particular circumstance. That doesn't mean that the Spirit acts like like a GPS in our hearts and all we do is we follow the direction that we feel is right. We cannot merely say, well, well, I feel like this is the right call, so I'm going to do this. And and you can't tell me otherwise because I'm discerning it in the power of the Spirit. No, if we read again in verse 12, Now we received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And the things given us by God are centered in and around the gospel of salvation. It's the living word of God. It's the riches of God's wisdom contained in these wonderful pages. And if we're judging things, if we're doing things that run contrary to this word, then we're proving ourselves to be like the natural person. One that does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. So what does this mean? It means it's work, brothers and sisters. It means that judging all things in life Discerning everything spiritually, it's work. Careful work. It's work that's done with the Spirit of God in hand. So are we to have this secret, hidden wisdom of God decreed before the ages for our glory? Locked up. Kept on the shelf, gathering dust. No, we shall not. We must be diligent in our devotions, careful in our search of the Scriptures, ever mindful of the indwelling Spirit guiding us away from darkness into the path of light, into the light of His Word. For if we do not, beloved, we will ultimately fail to understand. We will fail to recognize God's richness. More and more we'll fall prey to the world's perspective on the Bible. It's just an old book. It's written in the Bronze Age, in the Iron Age, by some backwater peoples. We'll consider it like the world does. Folly. We'd fail to discern all things.
who is a natural person who is unable to understand things. The word for natural person is also used by the Apostle Jude in his short letter. He calls those who set up divisions worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Worldly here means natural in Jude's letter. People of the world in Adam have been robbed of the gifts of God that continue in darkness. They have not been renewed by the Holy Spirit and they remain dead in trespass. One day they will assemble before the Lord and will be forced to give an account of their sins, their failure to rule this world properly. Though we've been given a task by our Lord to be stewards of this earth, apart from Christ, this task will never be accomplished and God will judge accordingly. And how could we? The task that the Lord has given us can only be done in His ways. And humanity has rejected His ways wholesale, not even able to recognize them. Now, one thing we do need to be careful about here is people cannot blame God for not understanding and believing. One is not allowed to say, to just shrug their shoulders, Well, I'm just a natural person. I'm not able to understand the Bible. It's not my fault. I'm not a Christian. God can't punish me for not believing. It's too confusing. It's not as though people will be able to point their fingers at God on judgment and say, Well, your word wasn't discernible. I couldn't believe in Jesus. It's not fair I didn't believe while on earth. Nor aren't they to say that The sermons were too confusing or overwhelming. And the messengers of God didn't present it in a proper manner. For even those who preach for the wrong reasons still result in the name of Christ crucified being made known, as Paul reminds the Philippians. Paul tells the Romans that man does know the divine exists, that this creation testifies to the power of God and His invisible nature, that everyone is without excuse. So we confess once more together with the canons, this time Article 5 of Chapter 1, that the cause or guilt for unbelief is by no means in God, but rather in man. It is because of disobedience that those who formerly received the good news fail to enter into God's rest, not because of God. But that's also why Paul calls it folly for those who are perishing, why the natural person doesn't accept it, why it is to be discerned and appraised. It's not because they can't wrap their minds around the concept as as though they're mentally unable to, to put it together. They lack the mental capacity. It's not because it's gibberish, spoken in a language they don't understand and can't decipher anyway. It's because they don't want to accept it. Because the pride and ego of man does not want to accept that it is nothing, that they're nothing in themselves, that it is only God who is to receive all the glory. It's because they cannot stomach having to serve a holy God who is to be worshipped in a way that He declares in a way they don't like. And that is why we find actually a subtle shift in how Paul describes them here in verse 14. First, the natural man does not accept. Then, Paul writes that he is not able to understand. The will of man, broken by sin and utterly consumed by its sinful passions and desires, is utterly bound to the way of death. Because human nature is so proud of itself and utterly set in rebellion against God, it can't help itself. Pride just shakes its head at God's plan of salvation, judges it as something that it would never, ever plan or do, and therefore rejects it. It becomes willfully blind to the truth of God's Word. This is the will of man. Is guilty of rejecting the Lord of glory and demanding his crucifixion. It's guilty of judging the things of God foolish. 
How are we to respond to this? How do we accept what Paul is saying to us? Are we to shake our heads in disgust at how the world rejects the Lord of glory? No, we can only humble ourselves before God, acknowledging that we too were humble, are natural persons, children of wrath, willful in unbelief. It's only in receiving the Spirit who is from God that we begin to understand. And that truth humbles our egos. And it's only in that humility, having cast out our egos, that we begin to display the mind of Christ in our lives. We begin to stop being so mindful of what the world thinks of our actions. When we discern that our action, our decision was made in accordance with God's word, then what the world considers foolishness is for us a simple spiritual truth. And investing so much into covenant children, raising them in the fear of the Lord instead of just shipping them off to any old school in town, that's confusing to the world. Even folly, when they consider how much time, how much effort, how much money is put into raising covenant children. Foolishness to the world. Public system's free, isn't it? Waiting for marriage isn't acceptable in this day and age when so much more time could be spent with your partner of choice. Wasting your Sunday sitting here in the pews when it's a beautiful day outside. It's not understood by someone who's tired from a week's worth of work and just wants to relax and enjoy the sunshine. Accepting the Bible as the infallible word of the divine God is a stumbling block for those seeking more scientific rigor in their belief systems. And so, in the eyes of the world, we are fools. But in the eyes of God, beloved, in the eyes of fellow believers discerning by the Spirit of God, we are understood that we understand these things and we understand one another. Let us never cease to give thanks to God for the outpouring of His grace and by His Spirit. Let us never turn away from the truths of this Word because the world doesn't like it, because it's not an acceptable message in the 21st century. Let us hold fast to our confession in Christ and humbly live our lives to His glory. Let us discern all things in Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you pour out your Spirit upon us. Now, for the sake of Christ Jesus, who went to the cross for our sins, who laid down his life, who took it up again on the third day, rising to new life and assurance of the new life that we receive in him. And by that power, by that grace, your Spirit comes. Your Spirit comes to us and works in us to give to us faith, a faith that is a sure knowledge and firm confidence and assurance of all that you give to us. Work in us by your Spirit, O oh Lord. Allow us to grow in this. Lord, if there are those who who do not believe, work in them also. And by your Spirit, they may have their hearts softened, their hearts opened, that they may receive, that they may be given new life, that they may discern and believe and walk in your ways. Guide us and protect us in this. Allow us to live before you day by day all of our lives. We give thanks to you, O Lord, that you give to us your word, that we may read from it faithfully, that we may read from it and grow in knowledge of who you are and what you've done for us, what you continue to do for us, and how we are to live before you. We thank you that you teach us that we may live with one another. And you've also given to us marriage, 
And so we give thanks to you also in rejoicing with Reverend and Mrs. Sycamore that they may celebrate their 67th wedding anniversary. Guide them and protect them also, O Lord, and give to our dear brother and sister strength day by day. We thank you for the years of ministry that you have allowed them to carry out. Lord, be with all those in our midst who are expecting children, especially the mothers. Surround them with your love and your care. Give to them strength and patience. Give to them grace by your spirit also less. The new life also grows within their wombs. Be with those who would desire to have children but have not received children from your hand. Give to them grace also, O Lord. Allow them to wait patiently on you. Allow them to continue to serve you day by day in accordance with your word. Be with those who would like to be here in our presence but are unable to join us for various circumstances, Lord, especially those who are unable to join us on account of health, on account of sickness. Grant to them strength and restoration. Also be with our seniors, Lord. Surround them with your love and your care. We remember in particular those who are living at Shalom. Give it to our sisters Hamster and Kielstra and our brother Van Heisen, all that they stand in need of. We thank you, O Lord, that they are living members here. Even though they are not physically present with us at this time, grant also that we as a congregation do not forget them, that we remember them in prayer and that we also visit them as opportunity arises. Father, grant that day by day as we walk before you that we may also rejoice in the various sufferings that you place before us. Not that we take pleasure in what goes wrong, but that we may recognize and discern that these two also have come from your hand. Father, I grant that the various trials that do come may also serve their purpose and be removed from us especially for those, O Lord, who are sick, who are feeling unwell. Lord, at this time, we lay before you the needs of our sister Christina, Rawrida. We ask you to continue to guide her and protect her. Lord, we thank you that her thyroid came back as normal, a grant that this may continue to remain the case. Bless her, protect her, a grant to her also, healing following the surgery that will take place in a few weeks' time, Lord. Give to her and to her husband patience. Father, we thank you for your grace and your care to us. We thank you for your word to us. We thank you that you allow us to be a congregation here in adoration. We thank you that you allow us to discern by your Spirit what is good, right, and proper. Bless us as we go from here that we may remain true to this, that we may remain true to your word, not only today, but every day this week. In Jesus' name, we lay these things before you. Amen.